Hello and welcome to the Thoughtful Software Podcast. We believe thoughtful people and thoughtful software will change the world for the better. This podcast is all about diving into new technology and discussing industry trends, but more importantly, we are passionate about helping people be better at what they do. This is the focus of what we call Thoughtful Software. Today, we're welcoming Skip List Director of Engineering, Ben Van Griff, to the show. This episode is all about learning and how polymaths approach life and work in the tech industry. We're discussing what it means to be a polymath, being a generalist versus being a specialist, and what it takes to become a polymath today. So here's Ben, Fahad, and Andrew kicking us off. We hope you enjoy. Hey, Ben. Thanks for joining us today. I'm super excited. Yeah, me too. Let's get to it. So why don't you uh, get started and maybe give us an a intro. My name is Ben Vangrift. I've been uh, involved in technology since my math teacher, Mr. Higdon, didn't want me to get bored. So he handed me an Apple IIe. It was off to the races from there. I grew up on a farm in Kentucky. Went to the University of Kentucky to study engineering. I studied a lot of things in addition to engineering. And I settled on computer science and mathematics, working for about 20 years and happy to have joined the team at skip list awesome and you're happen to be our director of engineering as well so that's that's awesome to have you on uh why don't you describe to us what is a polymath let's start there a polymath is a person of encyclopedic learning uh, which sounds really scary but it is an expert in many different and sometimes disparate subjects cool would you call that a t-shaped person too or potentially a renaissance man uh, I guess you'd be a Renaissance woman too. Renaissance person. Yeah, Renaissance person's even better. Uh, so what would you, would you call those the same? The, so the T-shaped person uh, is broad and has a single line of depth. That's the middle of the T, right? A polymath looks like kind of a jagged upside down chart. There are many areas in which they go deep and very broad across the board. So you think about a specialist as somebody who's very deep in, in one spot, right? Then there's the generalist who is, you know, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. You compare that to a polymath, and a polymath is a jack of all trades and master of many. Mm. Is, that, is that possible? Or like, is that common? It's not common, but I don't think that's the human's fault. Uh, we're not really set up for pursuing multiple areas of specialization because of the way our industry works and, you know, the assembly line and factories and a hundred years of industry in the United States. Interesting. So how, how would one go about becoming a polymath? Like obviously humans can do it. Uh, you're doing it. Um, I feel like maybe I fall into that category too, possibly for hot as well. So, but how would a poor person go about this? Do you just read articles all day, read a couple books? And it's a good, lot or of is work. There more to it than that. Uh, so I guess, First, you have to kind of understand that you're not going to get a payout for this. It's a passionate curiosity about the world. Somebody can't decide to be a polymath and then embark upon a course of study without first having like a baseline curiosity, wandering around the world like, how does everything work? Why does this work this way? You know, how do trees grow? What does causes rain to fall? How, what, what is physics? Um, never being satisfied with not knowing things. There's, a, there's an Alton Brown line that I like. There's nothing I hate more than not knowing everything. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of the way you have to start play. Uh, you can learn more or less efficiently depending on how familiar you are with your own learning style and whether or not you're studying topics adjacent to a topic that you already uh, have expertise in or you're just kind of opportunistically picking up whatever sit in front of you. If you're inclined in that direction, you have to take that topic and basically dedicate yourself to following it all the way down. Mm. Like wherever it goes, you put in your 10,000 hours or your 5,000 hours or whatever it is for that particular topic and you don't stop. Uh, so I would say you give up all of your free time, but you'd be learning anyway. So it's just a more focused. I find that when you say polymath, and I looked it up when we first started researching the podcast, it really harkened back to a lot of founders that I know, including myself. Um, when I started my journey as a founder, I really wanted to be a business in a box, is what I used to call it. Um, and I didn't want 
to rely on anyone else. I wanted to be able to do accounting myself. So then I went really deep on accounting and I didn't want to rely on legal. So I went really deep on how to incorporate and what you had to do and the requirements there. And then I went deep on obviously study computer science and went really deep there so I could build any platform I needed. You know, I learned mobile development. I learned web development. I learned embedded development too, just in case I was going to do an IoT startup. And I really went broad on everything just so, you know, when I did eventually start my companies that I did, I wouldn't have to rely on other external services. I could move quickly, build what I needed to build, sell it, all of that. Um, and I continue to do that, right? Uh, I will tell you, I'm probably involved in too many things. And you'll tell me that too, uh, or you already know it. You know, obviously, I'll never be a CFO level accounting person just uh, because it's just not possible to go that deep knowing that I have to do a lot of generalist type things, but understanding it enough to be dangerous and also be able to assist when needed. I think that's incredibly important. Um, more, as I using sports acronyms, more LeBron James who can do everything than Michael Jordan. I think Michael Jordan's the greatest scorer in history, but LeBron James might be the best basketball player in history. One comment I had, one thing I think is interesting though, is like if you're going broad, I'm more interested in, are you being, are you effective? Like, were you effective as, you know, you're learning accounting or now embedded systems or cloud services? Can you actually provide value even though you're going across multiple subjects? I mean, is that possible? Absolutely. I mean, we, uh, hell, um, I'm able to come in and work as an enterprise architect, but also help startups um, to completely separate skill sets to be sure. And uh, it's because you have a deep understanding. And I think once you understand the complexities involved in it, uh, you can choose to say, I'm not gonna worry about that complexity. Like for example, SOC 2. I don't really worry about SOC 2 too much. I know the things you need to be to be compliant. I only know a certain controls you can put in place. I don't know all of them. So I'm not a SOC 2 specialist, for example. Um, our CFO is phenomenal at SOC 2 and the other compliance needed to be able to run a, say, a publicly traded company. The real limitation is time. Yeah, exactly. Like you can do all of those things, but there's a finite amount of hours in a day and days in a week. So when you start to uh, take on more work or bigger challenges, you, you really need other people around you. And when you look at, like historically, in many fields, even today, although not most fields, it is the person with the multidisciplinary experience that serves as a connector for everyone else. So you end up in a position of coordination where you're translating from your subject matter expert to your engineer, for instance, and you know what we do, uh, or let's say you're in the nursing field, you translate from the doctor to the patient, to the radiologist, to the pharmacist, because you speak all of their languages very fluently but they don't speak each other's languages very fluently. How did you get into in, interested in this area? I wasn't really aware that it was an area one could be interested in until way late in life. But uh, I did grow up on a farm. And when you're growing up on a farm, you have to know how to do everything, right? Um, you've you've got to be able to fix the tractor and balance the books so that you can pay back the, the loan from the farm store. You have to know what plants you can grow, what you can't grow what kind of soil needs to be there, you know, various additives and work processes. And sometimes you're building a new barn and sometimes you're doing this other stuff. So you, you end up becoming fluent in a lot of different, very practical occupations. So going to college and trying to pick a specialty was super hard. Like, wait, what do you mean I only get to study one thing? Are you, are you insane? How does it even work? All through that time, people were you know, I got referred to a few times as a, as a Renaissance man. I'm like, I don't know what that means. Um, and it wasn't until like way later, I started to study like polymaths, historic polymaths and their learning strategies and everything else. Why is it important to understand this topic? You know, uh, polymaths see things differently, obviously, but is it important for us to uh, learn this and study these types of people more? I think it can be. I think you can gain a lot of advantage by figuring out how to learn you, you don't get multidisciplinary expertise without figuring out how to take information and to shove it into your head and make it stick there. Uh, so learning strategies and learning to learn are, are two of the most obvious things, but 
if you know what you're looking for and you're trying to solve a really hard problem that crosses multiple disciplines, you need someone that can, that can do that, that can do all of those things. If you're not aware of the existence of polymaths or who, <laughs> who you might tap to perform that task, you end up not doing a very good job because the really hard, knotty problems require the information to be condensed into one mind and then spit back out into all of its various other disciplines. Interesting. So this form of auto uh, didactism, if you will, do you think you have to learn how to learn by yourself or is there a different way of achieving the same result? Like for example, uh, MOOCs, uh, massive online courses, uh, YouTube, um, and uh, really uh, the internet has disrupted forms of learning. You know, it used to be you go to school because there's no other choice. And then we invented the book, the printing press rather, and then the book. And that changed how people were taught. But still, you had to go to school so someone could, you know, read that book to you. Do you think that we're going through another learning renaissance where people will become autodidacts? They have to be to exist in the world. And then by some sheer luck, or not sheer luck, I mean, sheer coincidence, most people become you know, uh, polymaths, because while you're learning, it's impossible not to branch out. I mean, you have to learn uh, different, when you want to learn one topic, you tend to have to learn many topics to really understand the topic you're trying to learn. Well, so I don't think that's true for most topics. I, I think most topics you can compartmentalize into a single line of learning. Uh, as a, you know, as a for instance, you can become a perfectly competent uh, senior level JavaScript programmer without understanding core principles of computer science. Entirely possible to do that. Not even understanding your own discipline enough to, uh, to be considered a real expert. Uh, so the world doesn't necessarily motivate us toward multidisciplinary education. I think there's a lot of learning opportunity in the world right now. I think most of that learning is incredibly shallow. You think about the type of understanding you can get from a blog post versus a Coursera sequence of courses. Most people are willing to do a blog post. It takes commitment to go through a massive, uh, massively multi multiplayer learning experience and uh, get all the way through to the end of the course. And the quality of education isn't necessarily the same quality you get from a practical hands-on one-on-one uh, -on -one experience with a mentor or a teacher, or even a lab. It's possible to uh, become uh, polymathic in today's world and under today's education structure, but it doesn't really decrease the, uh, the need for a will to commit the time and effort to expertise as opposed to a passing understanding. Gotcha. So I'm going to go on my specialist thing in a second, and I'm going to challenge you a little bit. However, I want to, uh, for, from your studies, the people I've studied that I would count as polymaths, they tend to have a near eidetic memory, meaning they have a photographic memory, and that really assists them in learning, right? They have a natural leg up because of the way their brain works and the way they record things, and they just become sponges in a way. Is that your experience with the people you studied in history? And if so, uh, can people without that level of memory become polymaths? Uh, I certainly hope so, because I do not have that level of memory at all. Uh, I barely remember what I was doing 10 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> I, I, you think about like the classic example is Leonardo da Vinci, right? He wrote everything down. His memory was okay, uh, but he wrote everything down. The, mm. you know, anatomy drawings, bird skeletons, engineering diagrams. He just wrote everything down. So it is possible to externalize all of that information and capture it for later reference. Uh, but the other thing that you can do is when you are learning something, you, through various means, push your understanding down into your subconscious so that it becomes instinct. It's a little harder to do that. And you don't always know when you look at something, when you look at a problem, where that answer comes from. And that makes it kind of hard to explain, <laughs> uh, but it does work. Interesting. So you're saying making learning intentional, 
uh, uh, you know, making sure that you're, uh, well, th there's two things that are actually unpacking what you said. There is making learning intentional, which is I'm going to learn this thing and these are the steps I'm going to take and making practice intentional too. But then you mentioned making learning uh, habitual slash instinctual. Those two are odds, aren't they? If it's instinctual and habitual, then I'm not making it intentional on purpose. I mean, you can make a habit intentional, but that just makes the habit pointless at the end of the day, right? No, no the, the goal of the intention is to make it instinctual. So you're not just absorbing things willy nilly from the field, right? You're, you are uh, training yourself to think in a particular way or use a certain set of criteria or to be able to recall a certain formula or, or whatever else with the goal of that knowledge becoming instinctual. That's deep, man. So I want to discuss something that you mentioned earlier, which is uh, becoming a polymath and pay off. I want to challenge that thought. I think we're at a point in, a, in our field of computer science where it's pretty nascent, all things considered, where a generalist actually makes more money than a specialist. Uh, this is almost the inverse of what happens in medicine, but medicine's one of the most mature fields on the planet outside maybe war. Um, so the, you know, you look at that and anesthesiologists get paid way more than a general practitioner. And it makes sense at the end of the day why that's the case. But because we're so nascent, you know, you see generalists making lots of money because they can solve a vast category of problems. And we haven't solved nearly enough problems yet using computers to make it where those generalists aren't necessarily needed as much. Would you agree with that statement? Kind of, but we're talking about generalists, not polymaths in this case. Mm. And I draw a separation between those two things. So a generalist in software, for instance, knows how to do user experience design. They know how to uh, put together the front end. They can do the back end. They can design the databases. They can you know, uh, deploy an enterprise product across many different uh, virtual machines. That's a lot of stuff to know how to do at an expert level but it's all still just technology. It's one field. If they can also <laughs> perform surgery, <laughs> if they can also, you know, uh, design a circuit board, if they can also like repair a car, you know, now we're starting to talk about multidisciplinary learning, not just inside of the field of technology or even the subspecialization of software. Well, by that definition, again, totally perform surgery, just not very well. So. <laughs> please please do not <laughs> but to go back to medicine for a minute though nurses are the generalists of the medical field and they do connect the anesthesiologist and the doctor but you're still inside of medicine mm. right this is all medical study this is this is uh you know uh anatomy and biology and chemistry as it pertains to the human body makes sense are they also a concert pianist? You know, when you start stepping outside of a field of study, that's when the term polymath starts to apply in earnest. And that's why they are a fairly rare breed. So uh, when, when an engineer developer is, let's say, considered a polymath or they have multidisciplinary expertise, how does that help them in that specific field? Like how, how would that help them become a better developer? From a music perspective, I was a uh, symphony bassist. I played in the Alliance Symphony Orchestra uh, for like <laughs> one concert. But I, the appreciation of music, knowing how to play it at, a, I guess, a higher than normal level helps me learn programming languages um, and quicker, I believe, uh, one of the reasons I can do that. So that music helped me be a better programmer. On top of that, composition becomes normal in a mind of a musician because that's what you do if you're trying to make music. I think that that in of itself also helps designing programs. Uh, that's just one example from a personal standpoint. Yeah, music definitely has patterns and structural functions and using the uh, musical note system in the Western world, we're used to a certain uh, division of frequencies that sound pleasing and a certain progression of chords that, that, uh, that work versus things that don't. If you start to get into the music of the non-Western world, 
you don't have those note divisions anymore. You, you don't have the same preferences as far as what sounds are pleasing to the ear. And it's interesting listening to uh, non-Western music for that very reason, to get exposure to this different idea about what a song is. Um, and that's useful because as a software developer, we tend to fall into patterns of behavior. We want to do things the same way. We want it to be repeatable. We want to solve new problems. But our tool set tends to uh, become habitual instead of uh, inventive, just because you know humanity is fundamentally lazy. It's like we have to conserve calories because there might be a tiger over there. Uh, but I think for me, influencing uh, my, my development as a software engineer, uh, or I should say the programs that I write, I can look at any number of things outside of the field and to use those as inspiration for creating things inside the field. Anytime there's a really difficult problem, you reach the limit of what you know in, your, in one field of specialty, and the only way to get around it is either to invent something wholesale, which almost never happens, or to pull in an idea from somewhere else. So as a for instance, deciduous trees pull in their leaves in the winter. There's a chemical trigger that causes them to do that that varies by tree, but it's based on temperature, amount of sunlight. And they do this because uh, producing chlorophyll is a very expensive process for a tree. So they yank the chlorophyll back in and uh, drop the leaves off because the leaves at that point are basically just like cellulose shells. All the good stuff's already back in the trunk, ready for next year. If that doesn't sound like uh, a scaled deployment, of a multi-server architecture based on load. I don't know what is. If you think about the kidneys and the liver and the spleen and the, the blood filtration system and chemical production systems of the body, uh, the liver can regrow itself. So there's a level of natural redundancy. That's, that's inspiring. There are two kidneys. They are more fragile, but there's two of them. And then all of the slop work uh, fails over to the spleen. And each of them do slightly different tasks. And the liver's got a, a lot more jobs than that. But as far as uh, responsibilities and redundancy and failover, you know, looking at human anatomy is pretty inspiring because we're really hard to kill. <laughs> well, okay. So this brings up something really interesting. Um, probably a lot of people listening to this are like, holy shit, I'm a polymath. Um, or I may have some of this in me. How important is it to be conscious that you you know you you need to look at multidisciplinary, you know topics and subjects and try to apply it. Or are we just like naturally doing this? Like did Leonardo just naturally do this, or did he understand that he knew all these other different areas that could help him solve this one particular problem? He set out to become a polymath. He he wanted to become an engineer in an era when engineering was starting to uh, become much more precise than it had historically been. Uh, so he started as a painter and wanted to paint things more accurately to see, uh, like the human body, for instance, has certain muscle structures. And when you move those muscle structures, movement under the skin creates the impressions of light on the skin, light and shadow. Those were two of his favorite things to, to fiddle with in the painting world. But you can't just take somebody apart, right? You can't peel back their skin and see what the structure is that's causing the body to move. So quite on purpose. Uh, he had spent a lot of time in um, an apothecary shop to get painting supplies. And then medicine, the mixture of medicine and the mixture of paints is really similar and at that point in time to, uh, to be able to dissect bodies. You had to be a doctor and you went through the apothecary study to become a doctor. So he would take these little steps, these little sideways steps on purpose to get to the place where he really wanted to be. It took a long time. It took decades. Yeah, I don't think most people are aware, though. You know, that's the, that's the thing I'm trying to get at is, like, you need to be conscious of it. I don't think so. I think you have to be driven by either your bare curiosity about the world or a goal you want to achieve or a bunch of problems that mm -hmm. land in your lap that you need to solve. You can intentionally set it on the path, but a driver gets you from generalist 
all the way through the hours and hours and hours and hours of study and practice to an expert in multiple things. Let's talk about the polymath organization. Right? This is of interest to everyone on this call because Skiplist has to become a polymath organization. What I mean by that is, you know, we have clients in, uh, let's say, entertainment. We have clients in uh, hospitality. We have clients in construction and, and then many verticals past that. But how does an organization build up that memory of let's ensure that we're learning about these, we know how they act, and also share that with the other industries, right? Trends in construction affect entertainment and hospitality. And we want to share architecture clues and architecture thoughts from other parts to build better software. How do you do that as an organization? How would you transform the idea of a polymath individual to a polymath organization? Well, so Da Vinci wrote everything down. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, and that's a good start, right? Uh, you don't necessarily need a, an organization that is full of polymaths to be a, polymath organiza a polymathic organization. Uh, all you need is a way to capture and regurgitate the information to have it on hand. So some of that is by cultivating the, uh, the careers of the people that you have, giving them areas of specialization, letting them choose their areas of specialization, and then capturing all of their information. You, you incentivize them in some way to share everything that they've learned and to be available. And if you happen to have a structured learning pathway inside of your organization and kind of a commitment to uh, the development of uh, the people that work there, uh, it kind of becomes natural. You start to share everything and then you have ready references when you don't already know the thing that you need to know. So we're making learning intentional, making pathways in the organization that's one way. Um, do you believe organizations that are larger that say they have expertise in all these verticals actually have expertise in all those verticals? Or do you think that they have one or two people that might be experts and they just spend their time writing things down based on your previous statement? Tell me what the difference between those two things is. Well, one is inherent know-how, right? You, like, someone that's worked in banking for 25 years as an executive inherently and instinctually understands parts of that industry that they might not be able to write down. It's just, you know, you, you don't know what other people don't know. And some people are really good at sharing information and other people are just really good at their jobs. Mm -hmm. And so are they writing down the true insights that those, that 25 uh, year executive has, or are they writing down the high level things? And so one, one is deep insight and the other one is surface level. Does it make sense? It does. Uh, it does. So I would uh, kind of approach the thinking about that problem this way. If you have a person who has deep expertise in a subject and they're a member of the organization, then the organization has that deep expertise. Right. As projects proceed, more people develop that expertise by working with that person. And whether or not the company has that expertise when that person gets hit by a bus is largely mm -hmm. depending on the amount of time that's been spent sharing that information and, and understanding what's shared. So it's, you could conceive of an organization who had taken advantage of this, of this individual's deep banking expertise or deep entertainment system uh, or entertainment industry expertise for years and years to the point where that had been conveyed across so many people in the organization who had worked on those projects that you can still claim to, be, uh, to have expertise as an organization. And on the flip side, if you have a deep expert, but they're not working on projects that apply to that expertise, and then they get hit by a bus after like six months, probably all gone. So mm. you got to start over. Interesting. That's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. Uh, avoid buses. <laughs> <laughs> I try to. Buses try are to. terrible. Well, you know, like orga, uh, organizations, people generally look for like the next thing, right? Uh, and how to improve themselves. Do you think organizations would find it more rewarding if they promoted uh, polymaths or polymathic, uh, you know, learning in the organization? Manager, what do you think? I got to say, you, I mean, there's two ways to look at that question. First is how valuable is it to the organization to have more polymaths, right? It could be, 
investing in it's actually a detriment to the organization. I think on the flip side, having polymath provide an example of what you could be. And I believe everyone needs something to look up to. We all do. We're human beings. We're tribal. And in that sense, you need people to say, I really respect that person to uh, mimic their behavior, if you will. And so promoting polymaths, I believe, is smart because those people tend to be very good at coordinating across. For example, Ben is really good at speaking business language and he's really good at speaking to engineers. And so having him in a natural role where he has to do both makes sense. And that's more of a generalist, as he mentioned, but there's also a sense of polymathic between the business side of things and the engineering side of things, two separate domains that tend not to mix very often um, in a positive sense anyways. So I think that that's valuable. So it, to really hone that answer in, I'd say there's probably diminishing returns in continuing to invest in even more polymaths, uh, but having some in your organization, putting them in positions where they can truly use their uh, multiple verticals of knowledge and then leveraging that and creating more so that you have bench strength probably is a very intelligent and responsible thing to do. I'm going to come at the question from a slightly different angle. To understand the amount of time it takes to master any particular discipline uh, has to inform the question. So if you want, let's say, a, you, have a, you have a software developer and they really want to start designing uh, IoT boards, right? They're, they're going to uh, make special purpose devices now because you can see that that field is opening up. So you're encouraging someone to do that. That's probably 18 months of study. So to get that deep expertise, at least you have to spend that amount of time. Uh, a company has to think very strategically to understand where they want themselves to be in two years or three years and to start making the investment in the people uh, that are a part of the organization to get them to where they need to be when it's time for them to be there. Uh, also, a lot of people don't necessarily want to put in the course of study. You know, uh, many people totally okay. They want to uh, come to work, do their work, go home and pursue their other interests. Mm -hmm. The thing is, the pursuit of those other interests is also multidisciplinary learning, right? So maybe they are an expert kayaker. That's going to provide uh, some inspiration when they're writing some sort of web application, perhaps. Uh, maybe they're an avid gardener and they can tell you about the interaction of soil pH on any given variety mm -hmm. of plants poisoning the ground or making the ground nice or changing the color of your dahlias, uh, you know, whatever it happens to be. Encouraging and allowing for extracurricular activities and, and home time is almost as good as dedicated training programs. Interesting. And I bet a lot of our listeners are probably thinking, well, what does this have to do with thoughtful software? Why do I'm listening to this? Cause I want to understand how thoughtful software is made. And I want to, I'm running a statement by you, true or false. Thoughtful software is in itself contextual. And without understanding the context you're operating in, how can you build thoughtful software, right? So it's different. Building something in entertainment, for the most part, has some intricacies building something in, say, banking. doesn't, and vice versa, right? And you don't have to do PCI compliance for the most part in entertainment unless you're actually collecting payment. Um, but in banking, almost always, you're under PCI DSS. Uh, regulations for an example of how software can be contextual. True or false, Ben? I think that's true. Uh, I think the context of the business domain that you're operating in is super important. Um, the flexibility of the uh, tool stack that you have to use because of other business concerns, like it recommends against being a specialist, I think. If you're providing services to a wide variety of industries and clients, only knowing one or two things is going to make any individual in the organization less useful across the board. So it is definitely worthwhile to uh, broaden out some. But in terms of business domain, it's definitely true that they are wide and disparate. Mm. And I think for 
thinking a thoughtful software, I think you have to then get more towards the polymathic version of things rather than the uh, singular focus. And to really understand uh, how to build software the right way, you have to understand a lot of differing and disparate, as you said, uh, verticals and also technologies and really uh, at being a polymathic organization is required to do what we do. Yeah, the, the information, uh, the knowledge has to be pretty deep. The understanding has to be pretty thorough, not just of the technology, uh, which needs to be both deep and broad, but of the, of the business domain. Yeah, I agree, 100%. Could we, could we hack, hack this? Like you mentioned, polymath takes time or you know, going across different you know, disciplines it takes time. Is it like possible to create like a Tim Ferriss four-hour you know, work week hack or something like that to achieve you know, these types of results? I don't think so. Uh, in order to really have a deep understanding of a thing, you have to spend a lot of time with it, whether that's another human being uh, or uh, a particular subject. The narrower the subject, if you only wanted to learn uh, how this particular insect reproduces and to become an, insect, uh, an expert on this one insect, it would be easy to become an, uh, an expert on that one thing. If you didn't need to know the biological process and you just were, you know, memorizing a, a fact sheet, but for any subject bigger than a bread box, uh, it just takes time. It takes time and experience to develop the kind of wisdom that you, that you want to be able to bring into play uh, to, to thoroughly understand something. Uh, otherwise, you're just kind of speed dating different knowledge sets. Yeah, I think it's, it goes back to what you mentioned earlier about you know, shallow versus deep, and I think that's what's lacking mostly. And even a lot of the just content that's out there is just that depth of you know, really understanding like the nuances, you know, like when you speak with Andrew or even you about architecture, you know, people might say, oh, you just, you know, spin up something in AWS, but there's just so many things behind it and underneath it that, you know, when you actually start deploying something, you're like, okay, there's, there's a lot more to this. And if you haven't spent time there, you're just going to run into a lot of just badly written applications. And that's why a 68% failure rate, I mean, that's a one big, probably a uh, contributor to that i have like 36 different things i'm trying to say at the same time and my brain won't let go <laughs> <laughs> i would say one one comment i'll make about just a personal comment what i find fascinating about this topic is i i spent many years in like the wireless communication area in the business you know like lte and 5g and i found it really fascinating but i was more fascinated with like software applications and software architecture. And I always felt like I was cheating myself or cheating my job because I would always try to learn more about software than I did about, you know, wireless comm. And this kind of lets you think about, okay, you know, this is okay. This is kind of natural. This is uh, part of being human is to be curious and it is all right to go and investigate other areas and actually become experts in other areas, you know, so you can kind of do both if you have still have that desire to do that. Our industry punishes though, it punishes people who try to get uh, too much information. I don't think it punishes them on purpose, right? Uh, I think that it is hard for our modern employment apparatus to account for someone with a bunch of different sides of skills within the same organization. Uh, so for instance, I took a, a bit of a sabbatical earlier in the year. I kept my toes in the water uh, for, you know, for gigs and um, something I could do to, you know, keep myself in ramen noodles. Uh, but what I run into time and time again, it's like, oh, well, you've done this and you've done this and you've done this other thing. And, and you've, you've been, a lot of different positions and you know a lot of different technologies and we don't have any idea what to do with you so we're just not going to call you back or we're going to tell you that you're overqualified for everything like yeah probably am overqualified for almost any job that uh, you're going to put me you're going to put me in personally um, but that doesn't mean i can't do that job and it doesn't mean i don't want that job it just means that the HR department decided arbitrarily that you know too many things and you get kicked to the curb. So our hiring industry, particularly the uh, you know, talent acquisition, recruiting, 
um, HR departments in really large organizations where, you know, even engineering teams are outsourcing the role definitions to uh, some folks in an office that may not even be where they are. Uh, it makes it, it makes it tough to express too many skills on a resume and to, uh, to fight for a position, you got to kind of decide what you want to do and specialize. This is even more true in other industries that don't necessarily value uh, broad and general knowledge, which like the technology industry claims to do. I want to talk for a minute about my defense of the word polymath, which you probably picked up on. And the key is deep expertise, right? It's, uh, I say deep expertise and I, I, I really mean that. Otherwise we're in generalist territory and that's fine too. Generalists are awesome. So I, I play about a dozen instruments and I can write software for uh, basically anything. I get along pretty well with people, uh, can manage organizations, do their books, uh, can grow anything from seed. Uh, I have a lot of experience in a lot of different worlds. I do not consider myself polymath because only one or two of those things, maybe two or three, are deep enough that I consider myself an expert. I have a real trouble claiming real expertise. Uh, so I want to keep learning. I want to keep learning more and more and more and more. Uh, and that's just the way that I work. Um, I think for most people who achieve the title, who will be historically recorded as being polymaths of note, it's not that they know a bunch of things, even though that's true. It's that they know almost everything there is to know about a bunch of things. And that's the reason that these people get historic notes and biographies written about them and have generally shaped most of the important decisions in our world. So when I, I, I say the word polymath, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to use it lightly or as something that you can put uh, on your jacket as a little pin with a flag. You're, you're a beginner polymath then, I guess. <laughs> I would say aspiring, 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 <laughs> the white belt. And, uh, the other thing that I'll, that I'll mention that we haven't talked on is, uh, we've talked a little bit about how long it takes. Uh, but as a historical example, the thing that most people know Ben Franklin for is uh, something to do with electricity. He didn't start fiddling around with electricity until he was 40. It's a lifelong thing. You don't have to start when you're 20. You probably don't, you probably don't have the discipline for it when you're 20. Uh, you keep going until you die, and that's the way it goes. Hmm. I think that's a good spot to end, actually. Cool. Um, ben, thanks a lot for joining us today, and uh, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I had a great time. Thanks for listening. You can always connect with us at skiplist.com.